Welcome to this episode of Global Crimes, in this series we examine the harrowing aftermath of domestic violence. Today, we'll be taking a powerful look at two separate cases depicting contrasting outcomes of domestic violence, one survivor of domestic violence and another who was tragically unable to make it through. Domestic violence is a global phenomenon, and this can happen to anyone regardless of age, race, social status, or sexual orientation. The impact is destructive not only for the victim but also for the family involved. Through the powerful and stark comparison of these two cases, we aim to raise awareness on this critical issue and acknowledge the incredible strength and courage of domestic violence survivors. Let us embark on this journey to understand domestic violence and its long-lasting consequences. Charlotte Rooks is a survivor of domestic violence. Charlotte has shared her story to raise awareness about the issue and to help others who may be experiencing similar situations. She endured physical and emotional abuse at the hands of Craig Thomas, for several years before finding the courage to leave and start a new life. Things started to happen and, um, <laughs> like, he would stay over and um, he'd, like, say to me, you have to sleep standing up. And then, like, if I was falling asleep, he'd throw stuff at me. And my foster mum died, and she made he, like, was making me eat her pictures. Like, and it, that I was given a ring, like, something that was left, sentimental, and he made me eat that as well. It was very early in their relationship when Charlotte had discovered that she was pregnant with Thomas's child. The pregnancy seemed to trigger an escalation in his violent behaviour towards Charlotte. Numerous times when Charlotte was living in her house, Thomas would hit her in the stomach with the metal part of the hoover while she was pregnant. Sometimes they would be in the car and he would just repeatedly punch her in the side of the face. It was fear for her loved ones that kept her from leaving. Charlotte had a 13-year-old son from a previous relationship, Thomas would threaten Charlotte and say that his face will be ripped off. Then you'd say to my son, I only like this with your mother, because if she's going to keep this baby, I don't want her to bring her up, how she's brought you up, and stuff like this. At one point the police actually called by at Craig Thomas' flat. Someone had seen him beat me up and they called the police, she said. The police came in and he told them I was mentally ill, pregnant, and that he felt obliged to keep me. He told them he didn't love me but said that I was mentally ill and was carrying his baby. This was the opportunity. If they had put his name in the system they could have seen his criminal record. One time, the police left me again with him, and he knew he was invincible, and I knew I was going to die that night, I was convinced. And he lifted up the sofa and made me lie down, and put my arms like behind my head so that my hands were trapped under the sofa. And then he would just repeatedly would then jump on my stomach, and then if... Obviously, your body reaction is to go like this. My hands are trapped under the sofa. But if I couldn't control my reflexes, he would then stamp on my head. And, and I went on all day, or oh, sorry, all night. Craig Thomas was given a 10-year prison sentence. He was released after serving five years. Speaking to Wales Online, Charlotte, who still suffers from a string of health problems and PTSD, following Thomas's abuse, called for the reasons behind his recall to be made public. She said, I have been aware since January this year that Craig Thomas had been recalled to prison. Knowing his prolific history of violent offending I am not surprised that this has happened, only that it has taken this long for him to be caught. The law dictates that I am not allowed to know what Thomas has or has not done in which has resulted in his recall. I believe it is in the public interest that myself, other victims, Potential victims and the general public are kept fully informed of the whereabouts of such a dangerous and remorseless criminal. Her life was full. Um, yeah, she was perfect daughter, really. Ellie Gould was a bright 17-year-old student who loved horse riding and dreamed of a career in the police. She was studying for her A-levels last May when she was murdered by her ex-boyfriend Thomas Griffiths. Ellie Gould, 17, was the daughter of Matthew and Carol Gould, 
and lived with her family in Calney, Wiltshire. At the time of her death she was a year 12 sixth form student at Hardenwish School in Chippenham, and was studying for her A-levels. A keen horse rider, she participated in local equestrian events, as well as competing in cross-country. She had ambitions to join the Mounted Police and study psychology at university. Ellie celebrated her 17th birthday in early 2019. We trusted him. We welcomed him into our home. He celebrated her 17th birthday with us. Three months later, he murdered her. It was chilling. I will tap your head in. Rah, rah, rah. Clap, 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 clap. Ellie should have been celebrating her 18th birthday last week. Her friends were determined she wouldn't be forgotten. We had always, it was almost like a big milestone in mine and Ellie's relationship is that we get to 18 and we can go out and just be adults together and go drinking and do everything an 18 year old should be able to do. But obviously that's been ripped away from us and it's just, the idea that I won't be able to do that with her is literally heartbreaking. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Because obviously he got to, he got to have his 18th birthday and he took our Ellie's away from her. In January of that year, she began dating Thomas Griffiths, a fellow A-level student at her school, whom she had known since they were in year seven. Thomas was her first boyfriend. As Ellie's exams approached, she wanted to focus on her studies and felt the relationship was not right for her, so ended it in early May. Ellie said that she felt suffocated by Griffiths's attention, and on the night before her murder, told friends he had not taken the split well. She felt a bit suffocated and a bit um, trapped within it, and that she didn't really know what to do because she's really independent. The next day, Griffiths stabbed her repeatedly while she was studying at home alone. On the 3rd of May 2019, Thomas was dropped off at school by his mother. After emailing his teachers to tell them he was feeling unwell, he returned home. He took his mother's Ford Focus car and drove to Ellie's house. On arriving at Ellie's house, an argument occurred, Thomas attempted to strangle her, then used a knife he had taken from the family kitchen to stab her in the neck 13 times. Thomas then spent an hour at the house attempting to clean up the crime scene, using clothes to do this which he placed in a plastic bag. He also washed his trainers in the kitchen sink and cleaned the knife using an apron before placing it in Ellie's hand to make her injuries appear to be self-inflicted. He then used Ellie's finger to unlock her mobile phone and, posing as her, texted one of her friends who was due to give her a lift to school, telling the friend not to collect her. After returning home to change, Griffiths put his clothes in the washing machine, then dumped the bag of blooded items in a local woodland. A neighbour saw him returning from the woods and drove him back to school, where he was subsequently collected by his mother. Later that day he sent text messages to friends indicating that he and Ellie were going away on a break together, and to Ellie's phone asking her if they could meet. Ellie's body was discovered by her father at 3pm that afternoon in her kitchen. Matt went home from work first, which is quite unusual, and uh, he walked in and found her on the kitchen floor. And then I'll never forget that phone call of Matt, hysterical, saying, um, Carol, you need to drive home. Ellie's had an accident. Drive carefully, Ellie's had an accident. And I could tell by his voice, he was absolutely hysterical, just thinking, what on earth happened? What on earth happened? And as I was coming through the car, and a police car was trying to weave through the traffic, and I thought to myself, that's nothing to do with us, is it? And then as I pulled round, into our drive. Nothing could prepare me for police cars abandoned everywhere and an ambulance at the end of the drive and and then Matt just sobbing at the end of our drive. And I just ran up to him and a policeman said, Who are you? And I said, I'm her, I'm her mother. What's happened? What's happened? And I just couldn't believe it. Just couldn't believe it. Wiltshire police arrested Thomas on suspicion of murder at 6 pm on the 3rd of May outside a friend's house. Evidence was gathered from Thomas' mobile phone and CCTV cameras tracking his movements. He was sentenced in November 2019 to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 12 and a half years in custody before becoming eligible for parole.
because he was under 21 at the time of sentencing the law prevented him from receiving a whole life tariff. Ellie's mother, Carol, campaigned to have the law changed to enable young offenders to be treated more like adults when convicted of serious crimes, such as murder. The change in the law, announced by Justice Secretary Robert Buckland, is the culmination of a two-year campaign by Ellie's parents. It's heartbreaking. All the campaigning we've got, we've been doing myself and Julie Derby to, to try and level up this sentencing between domestic homicides and murders that happen in the street. And we were really hoping that, you know, there were, the 10 year difference would be leveled up. But it looks like it's not going to be much more than two years. And if I could just talk a little bit about the anguish that you go through as parents. Um, we had to visit Ellie in the morgue and they had to cover up her neck and her face with bandages and plaster so that we couldn't see the full extent of her injuries. Poppy's parents have a 25-page document detailing her 112 injuries. That's the anguish and the heartbreak that we live with every day, knowing how our beautiful girls were murdered. And... You know, just adding two years for that is an absolute insult to us. And I think Minister Arga and Dominic Robb owe it to us to have their meeting face to face, look in our eyes and explain to us how they have come up with just adding two years for the horrific nature of these crimes. Um, and, I, I, you know, I'd be really interested to hear how they have come up with that figure of just two, two years. Carol, Ellie's mother, who fought to change the law around murder, says her daughter would be very proud.